item on our agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. Um, first, let folks know that our schedule for February uh, is set and should be on the, I'm looking up at Christina to make sure it's on the website, or it's coming, it'll be out soon. Um, but I do want to just highlight a few of the meetings that we're, that we have planned for February. It's a very busy month. Um, on February 5th, we are um, going to have a data governance council meeting. That's up on the fourth floor of this building, and that is open to the public. Um, those occur every couple of months, so that is um, the first meeting of the month. The next day on February 6th, we'll have our regularly scheduled board meeting here in the Pavilion Auditorium at 1 p.m. We're going to be hearing some pharmacy pricing and pharmacy benefit managers information from then we're also going to get a presentation uh, from our own staff on an evaluation we did of our rate review program. And then um, the next week is TBD. Um, we will have something on that agenda, potentially some um, hospital information, but that has not been finalized yet. And then on the 20th, we're going to have a presentation by the qualified, um, from DEVA on qualified health plan design for 2020. And we'll also hear from the University of Vermont Medical Center on their um, quarterly report for the um, mental health capacity project. And then on Monday, February 25th, this is um, very exciting news because we've been working on this project for a while. We are reimagining uh, and had reimagined our general advisory <coughs> So on the 25th, we will be meeting with the newly formed group here, um, in, again, on the fourth floor pavilion room uh, from 2 to 4. That is a public meeting. So even if you're not on the general advisory, we uh, encourage the public to attend. We had over, we had about 45 applicants, and um, our goal was really to make it a smaller group so that it was a little bit more manageable to get advice for the board. So uh, we're, we're looking forward uh, to relaunching that general advisory. And then on the 27th of February, we ha also have a very exciting meeting where we're going to be hearing um, reports from the fields on the all-payer model. And that's going to take place in this auditorium at 9 a.m. And then in the afternoon, we have a qualified health plan uh, vote, potential vote for the standard plan design. So it's a quite busy uh, month with a, a lot of projects, but I think that um, I think that it'll uh, be a, a, as I said, a busy month, but a productive month for the board. And I believe that's all I have to report. Super. Thank you, Susan. Would a board member like to make a motion on the minutes of Wednesday, January 23rd? I'm going to put Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 23rd without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So now we get to the uh, agenda at hand, and it's uh, um, Workforce is something that I believe is the single biggest uh, topic that we face in healthcare. I look at the panel over there, and I know that we have uh, the right people in the room for this discussion. And um, it's my understanding that the order that has been asked for is Matt followed by Laura followed by Sarah Pina. Is that correct? Okay. So. Um, Matt Barowitz, uh, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, a very familiar face when it comes to uh, data statistics on uh, the labor force, and uh, we're very appreciative that you took time to spend with us this afternoon. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, anytime I'm starting one of these discussions, I like to first say that this is the start of a conversation as opposed to the end of a conversation. In a lot of ways, what I'm doing is preparing information to facilitate discussion and hopefully answer questions in anticipation of those questions being asked. 
but uh, understanding full well that this discussion or seeing the data that is available might stimulate additional questions. So please know that this is just the start of a conversation and that these are resources available to you as part of the work we do over at the Kabbalah Department of Labor. So um, excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. As you said, I'm Matthew Berowitz, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, the presentation is pretty simple. I'm going to really take through a lot of the breakdown of the data and then do a little bit of a couple pieces about projects that we're doing, which are database, before we turn it uh, back over to Laura, Sarah, and Ina down the line to talk more about projects in the works as it relates specifically to workforce. So first I do need to do a quick introduction because there are federal pay, uh, there's federal pay backing my participation here. So um, while I am a state employee, me and my division, we're 100% federally funded. Um, that money comes from the US Department of Labor. 70% which uh, comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they pay us to produce, compile, and release data consistent with Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics methodology. The data that we release is unemployment rate, uh, wages by occupation, employment by industry. Those are the big ones that we, we focus on and release. And the, the joy of being part of a federal system is that uh, you can be assured that the information we release for the state of Vermont or by county or by metropolitan area all of that uh, data, definition, methodology is all going to be directly comparable to the other 54 regions across the state. So we are part of this 54 territory national data system as funded by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That includes the 50 states, DC, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And that way, if you're interested in saying how many nurses are there in Vermont relative to how many nurses there are in California, you can be assured we're using the same six digit occupational code for the definition of nursing. Uh, relative to our counterparts in California. And that's just a little bit of a preamble to kind of take you into the world that I work in because they are federal definitions. And again, the good news, bad news about being federal partners is we're very transparent about what we do, how we do it, and the definitions we use. We understand full well that there's other people that might have different definitions. And this particularly because of, becomes of interest in conversations like this because, um, like take for example my job title, uh, economist, or excuse me, my job title will be Economic and Labor Market Information Chief. We can all have job titles that we make up, right? Um, whatever you want. Uh, got a good one? <laughs> uh, right, but an occupation is actually a federally defined six-digit code associated, and it's uh, tied to duties, tasks, educational uh, requirements, um, skills, abilities, all these things. So um, there's a lot of, like, say, new and emerging, like, panel manager is a, a good one that you talk about healthcare quite frequently. That is one of those ones that's right on the cusp and depending on, I've seen panel managers being recruited that have to have an RN or have to have a master's degree or need to have a bachelor's degree, you know, that is one of those occupations that's gonna fall through the crack at this time because we're still emerging. Um, but we are catching up with some of the newer ones. We are, we are very excited to add in um, nurse practitioners as a breakout occupation, which was significant. I think we did that about six years ago um, and that was something the states were clamoring for, saying you can't just lump all nurses together, that doesn't make any sense. A nurse practitioner has specific and different educational attainment uh, requirements as well as um, duties, skills, abilities, and as a result, a significant uh, difference in differential impact. Um, but the people who make it uh, possible for me to be here today is Employment and Training Administration. They say you have a lot of great data, now go talk about it, answer questions about it, have a website, do special studies, partner with organizations like the ones at this table. Okay. So, um, this is a busy graph, and it's always fun to start an economic presentation with a busy graph. Um, what this represents, 2001 current uh, calendar year estimates by uh, employment by industry. Now, again, definitionally speaking, we're talking about jobs, but one job is one job is one job. And that means a part-time job is gonna count as one, a full-time job is gonna count as one. We're not talking about any distribution about full-time equivalents, we're just talking about positions. And immediately, you can look, you, going along the bottom, you can see that there's some smaller industries, finance, uh, information, um, natural resources. Natural resources have been trending up, finance has been down, trending down, has this information, a lot of that has to do with consolidation um, from out-of-state entities. But if you just take away all the noise at the bottom and just really focus on the key five that this uh, graph is really highlighting, you can see, just even backing away, you can see right in the middle, just by coincidence, there's some structural disruption that occurs, and really what that is is an economic change in the business cycle. So in 2007, we had an economic peak. 
We bought in, so that means uh, employment hit a high. We went into recession. Around 2009, 2010, we started coming out of recession. How do you really see how the changes have occurred in the Vermont economy? And a lot of these stories are national. These are American stories as well, where that top uh, red line is the combination of education and health, and it swims past um, trade, transportation, and utilities, which is heavily dominated by trade, retail trade, wholesale trade. Um, so going from the number one largest concentration um, in the Vermont economy by sheer number of jobs, uh, manufacturing, then going down leisure and hospitality and professional business services on the rise. Um, but this idea of education and health, that's a combination of two very different sectors, right? You have NAICS Code 61 and NAICS Code 62 that often get aggravated into this super sector. And so we'll break this down a little bit more, but it's basically a five to one ratio. Um, for every five people in healthcare, there's one person in uh, education. Um, this is private employment as we're looking at it. So um, the bulk of this trend is coming from, or the bulk of the employment is coming from healthcare. And when we take it forward to say, you know, well, let's break out, let's start breaking down uh, education for health. You can see even at the top line, if you take it down to three digit or, uh, industry code, health and social assistance, now we've got a new friend attached to health. We've got a new friend, social assistance, which we'll break out as well. But health and social assistance have outpaced growth um, between 2010 and 2017. So this is basically the period of economic recovery since the recession, since the uh, Vermont economy bottomed out, where has growth occurred? Um, and it is interesting to point out that when you look at that trend line at the top, education and health, you don't see a dip like some have, or no recovery. So during the recession, there was no perceivable loss of employment, maybe a, a, a smaller growth rate or stable or flat employment, but ultimately it was a pause and then continued growth. Um, so we're starting to try and pair off education services, and you can see education services, these are private education services, not public, have been growing strongly, and all, both of those are growing strong relative to overall Vermont employment. So the trend line between health and social assistance, education services has been very consistent, about that five to one ratio. So of the 60,000, 50 are in health and social assistance, and 10, uh, 10,000 employees or workers are in education services. But as we start breaking down, now let's see what the, at the three digit level, what's happening within health and social assistance. You can see that the growth rates, there are a couple that are jumping out. Hospitals and social assistance are jumping out. And we can see that social assistance represents about a quarter of this population. So when I talk about 50,000 people in health and social assistance, you can take a quarter of them out. I'm not sure what the board's interests are in social assistance. It would include things like um, personal care attendance. Um, you know, so that's a tough one. That's again where you're talking about an occupation that, depending on how grant funded, might change how the occupation is defined between a home health aide and a personal care attendant. Um, you know, because a personal care attendant, 50% uh, of them are found in social assistance industries. So there's a high concentration uh, within social assistance. But just looking at the, the growth rates, you see ambulatory and healthcare services has had strong growth, 1.5 a little under two times the, the growth rate of the overall Vermont employment since the recession. Hospitals leading the way. Nursing re residential facilities um, has uh, growth rates about the same as Vermont employment. What and percentage of the total is the social assistance? Um, social assistance would be about a quarter of the 50,000. So we're talking in the neighborhood about 12, 13,000 employees. And on my walk over here, I had one of those aha moments because I was uh, struggling with my federal partner's website to get the data that I was looking for to calculate the location quotients, which are there in parentheses. And I realized I'm going to have to reissue this because those location quotients are not calculated correctly. And if my hunch is correct, they're understated. And let, first, let me tell you what a location quotient is, make sure I'm on the same page, and then we can talk about why I think it's understated. Um, a location quotient says, it would be great, you know, if I said that 10% of all employment in the state of Vermont is in manufacturing. You could easily say, well, is that good or bad? And then you could look and say, well, at the U.S., 9% um, of employment in, of the U.S. economy is in manufacturing. So location quotient takes an area and tries to standardize it because the scale of Vermont economy versus the U.S. economy is totally different. But if you looked at the relative share, so 10% being Vermont, over 9% being the US, if you divide those two percentages, so it's basically a ratio of a ratio of a ratio, ratio divided by a ratio, equaling a ratio, um, 
it gives you a, like a relative strength. And a lot of times you say anything below one means that you're typically importing those services or doing without. Anything over one, you're exporting those services or you have a high concentration of them. So we know and, or we've, we've uh, believed to be true that healthcare is a high concentration in the state of Vermont, some of which has to do with, um, as I'm told, uh, the large um, Trauma One Hospital in Chittenden County, which does ser provide services to upstate New York. That would be an example of how potentially we have um, higher concentration. But it also could be due to public policy or whatever the fact, because we have heard in other states that they are actually trying to build up healthcare faster than, say, Vermont is, and it's because we more, have more industry in place. The reason I think he's wrong is because when I did the calculation for the government, I included all ownership types, including local, state, and federal government. And the numerator only includes private employment here in the state of Iraq. So I'm believing that the numerator the numerator needs to go up, which would mean that these might even be low. Um, but I don't think that's gonna to be too significant, but it will push these numbers up. So when I say that ambulatory healthcare services have a 1.09 location quotient, we're saying for there's about 9% um, more on a relative scale employment and health uh, ambulatory care here in Vermont than there is in the US economy. So just something to think about. Social assistance, you can see that big number, 1.5, I mean, you know, it's a pretty significant, you know, a, a very large location quotient. And I don't know how other states um, structure their like home health care programs, but it becomes very interesting for our data when you look at personal care aides or home health aides, depending on how they are, um, what their work week looks like, it is possible that if you had, say, five clients, you did five home visits to five different people, that you're receiving five checks. And each check represents an employment opportunity, so that could be why our social assistance looks a little higher relative to others if they have it more in a, some sort of uh, clearinghouse way that you'd get one check based on your hours as opposed to based on the number of clients you had. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Have you done a chart that would compare this one to what total wages are in each of those components? No, I could. As opposed to look at the breakdown of uh, wages by um, these industries and then wages relative to the US. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah, I could. I have not done it for today, though. Okay. Uh, other thoughts, questions? We're going to make a note about that. Um, so, this is a slide I use a lot of times to actually kind of cut out some of the stuff they've done when I talk more uh, universally to other groups. We do occupational projection, uh, projections. We look at 10 years in the future and say, these are what we think the occupational demands will be in the Vermont economy in the next 10 years. Um, and so what was interesting about the last 10 years is that the growth basically mirrors what we're projecting to continue to occur. This continued shift in the economy um, away from manufacturing, which just got the significant down, um, some other pieces kind of staying stable, but this core three that's really driving um, the employment shift, the professional business and technical services, education and health services, and leisure and hospitality, we're projecting significant growth to occur um, in those industries. Um, I will point out that growth, because when at Department of Labor, we're always concerned about jobs and employment opportunities, Growth is only one way that a job opening can occur. Another way that a job opening can occur is retirement or natural job churn, where people are quitting or getting fired. And so though we highlight for growth purposes significant employment increases in those three, leisure and hospitality, professional business and technical services, and education and health, education and health being the big one in the middle of those three, we also highlight, or I also highlight when I go out, I talk about the significant number of openings that are going to be in construction, manufacturing, and healthcare specifically because we have an understanding of the demographics of the people in the positions. We know there is going to be a significant out migration of employees in those three industries construction, manufacturing, and healthcare just due to demographics. So let me ask this Is it possible that that column that includes healthcare is understating the problem? Because Here's, here's my hypothesis, and you tell me where I'm wrong. I look around, I see um, institutions of higher education struggling, places like Greenmount College closing, fewer students in our K-12, so there's pressure to um, 
downsize some of the staff. Um, so if we were to separate those out, would healthcare even be a bigger? I think that's a fair assumption. Um, I haven't looked at the, specifically for the growth piece, um, but as it relates to the profile and the replacement due to typical job churn or retirements, yes, uh, we're seeing a higher demand in that particular industry over private education. Yes, so this would just reflect job openings due to growth, and then when we look at our occupational breakdowns, we actually start looking in and folding in the demographic pieces and we start talking about openings, and we divide openings into openings due to growth and openings due to uh, separations or replacements. So I highlight that here because you will hear the Department of Labor talk about the significant number of opportunities in manufacturing, and you could look up here and say, well, the last 10 years it's been taking it on the chin, and the next 10 years it's projected to do the same, but uh, even though an employer might be going down in size of number of employees, if they were at 100, um, they might be losing 20 to retirement, they need to replace 10 of those and they know it. So there's a significant amount of openings, and that's what you're going to see in healthcare as well. Uh, the tightness of the labor market, because the overlap between not only growth, but uh, demographics, uh, the demographic profile of the workers, healthcare is the only one that had both of those criteria. Significant growth and significant demographic challenge. <clears throat> um, then, uh, just kind of taking a step back, we know that because what, what these are are projected openings, and projected openings only become uh, filled positions if you have the people, right? So now I'm kind of taking a step and switching away from industry data and starting to talk about labor force data. Um, and so this is, a, this is a, a projection that the Bureau of Labor Statistics created. Um, what it represents, if it's too small, it's the 1950 to 2060. It's basically a long-term, um, not only all the history, but the, a long-term projection of what the Bureau of Labor Statistics sees for the United States economy, not just by gender, but also by age. We're gonna look at age in a second. And what the Bureau of Labor Statistics is saying is that labor force participation rate of Americans is gonna go down. We're projecting it to do so. Not just men, not just women, and you could say, well, we've talked that Vermont is an older workforce, and Vermont's a little bit older than Americans, but Americans are aging as well, we know that. But when you break it out even by age, you're seeing it's the same thing there. So it's, it's, it's something more than just demographics. Um, and there's lots of economic research was started because of these graphs, and it certainly was a, a kick in the pants for the Department of Labor to get on board because when we, um, to change the course, because when we were looking at this data, the bottom line being mature workers, people 55 and older, um, you know, we, Sarah's gonna talk about opportunities or how we're looking at that population of serving them. The blue line is one that really started my division working on how can we ensure that the workforce or labor force participation of young people doesn't uh, decline because it's so important. A lot of economic research showing that the early entry, the early you enter employment, the better off you'll be in the long term because you learn, I think the upshot is you learn so much about yourself, your preferences, your likes, your dislikes in a work environment and those soft skills, if you have an opportunity to adapt those early and often that you might be able to uh, make better choices for yourself as it relates to education and future careers. Um, so that declining labor force participation among youth is a big shocker, but also the one that really started a lot of the national research is the projected decline in labor force participation among 25 to 54 year olds. And that's a really interesting one because that's the consider the prime age uh, for people to be working and to show that it was declining and projected to continue to decline. We said, well, what's going on there? We need to look into this. And a lot of the research actually points to uh, more rural parts of the country and specifically the population of white men, 25 to 54. So, so this idea that there is downward pressure on the labor force, not just due to demographics, but also due to uh, socioeconomic factors, which are a myriad of factors that are going on, but putting pressure on the labor force participation rate itself, plus you have ongoing economic expansion, meaning the, the labor pool is uh, short and shallow as it relates to available labor. We're seeing this tight labor market manifest in many different ways. Um, for several years now, lots of employers have been calling the department to say, I'm looking for workers, can you help us? Um, and this uh, spans more than just the healthcare conversation, but across the board, other industries as well. Can I ask a quick question before you move on? Please. Um, with respect to the labor force participation and the downward trend in that, is there also analysis on uh, preferences for hours worked among upcoming generations in terms of not unwillingness, less willingness to work 70, 80 hours a week? So yes, we're gonna participate in the labor market, but 40 hours is gonna be more the norm in terms of uh, I haven't seen any research on that. I certainly could dig into that to see. 
Um, you know, the, because this is, uh, well, the underlying data, this is household-based data. Um, and the way I think about uh, your question in, in, a more, in the modern light of how the uh, younger generations are looking at work more like gig economy or more like a, um, short term opportunities or project based work. Um, because this is household based survey data, the individual would hopefully respond. That's the theory that they would respond to that being employed. Um, but to the extent that this would put pressure on it, a modern economy or technology is potentially putting down on pressure. I think it's also, I mean, from what I've heard about the millennial generation and, and the other generations that follow, is that there's a, a more uh, preference for quality of life, work life mm -hmm. balance, right? So to the extent that they're just not going to be willing to put in 70 hour, 80 hour weeks, this might be an underestimate of the, you know, of the issues that we're going to be facing in terms of the workforce. Yeah. So. True. Um, yeah, good point. Other thoughts, questions, can we come? Uh, so, as I mentioned, the tight labor market is creating this opportunity, and that's where the department, um, my division, thinking about how do we get people talking about the conversation of skills and how skills translate to wages and employment opportunities. Um, so I did, uh, I have a couple of handouts um, available. Uh, but basically, this is our third version where we partner with the McClure Foundation to highlight the employment opportunities in the state of Vermont. Um, for many years after the recession, we were hearing in the public discourse uh, this idea that there was no jobs in Vermont, and that just frankly wasn't true. As I said, we, we were hearing from employers saying we're trying to hire, we can't find people. Um, and uh, as a result, this is one of the opportunities that we found to partner with the McClure Foundation since you have a lot of great data, but it's not very attractive or, attractive or easy to use for people who don't like Excel. So uh, we partnered with them and gussied up our data. And we divided the employment opportunities, well, we, had, we identified them just based on a sheer criteria. And we, we could, I could cut the data any way the group wanted, but basically at least 250 openings in the next 10 years and at least $20 uh, for a rate of pay. As a result, when you cut the data, there's about 600 to 650 occupations in the state of Vermont. When you cut the data with those two criteria, a critical mass of openings plus uh, a wage rate of at least $20, you ended up with 62 occupations in the Vermont economy that we, we consolidated them to be 62 that we could highlight. They're divided by Holland code to try and be more interactive. And Holland is a, a researcher who kind of developed this um, uh, profile of uh, occupations to kind of group them by skills, ability, but also like preferences. And there's this one uh, category which embodies a lot of the healthcare and what our conversation is about here today. Uh, do you like to observe, learn, analyze, and solve problems? And that's the group where you're going to see all the healthcare occupations. And so this is the way we look at occupations. These are occupational titles. So again, going back to federal definitions, um, individuals might have uh, job title preferences or emerging jobs that might not be accurately captured here. But you can see of this uh, grouping, uh, there's a, a heavy component of healthcare, uh, including dental. So this was just one of the tools we said we were going to create and try and partner and create outreach and support education institutions who want to have these conversations with their students. So we're doing a lot of outreach about this. Um, in addition, uh, the department expanded direct services to uh, recovery centers. And just anecdotally, and uh, based on some preliminary research, we're finding that people coming at, well, A, we've heard that um, one of the, uh, a barrier to sobriety can be uh, gainful employment, that engagement uh, is, is, can be very helpful, and a job giving someone roles, responsibilities. Um, we're finding that people coming out of it are actually looking to get back into it uh, on the service delivery side. So um, there's a lot of conversations right now, people coming out and then wanting to give back to the organizations that help them so much. So I think this is um, not only uh, demand of services related to career services um, and the recovery centers themselves, but potentially uh, supply. Um, we're expanding our public outreach and partnership with the libraries. Uh, I guess there's a population of individuals who are finding it more comfortable to go into libraries and ask for job search help than they do feel comfortable going into a government agency. So this uh, spring, we're actually going to be doing a train-the-trainer model with librarians. And if you've ever wanted to see a, a more willing, excellent group of participants that love resources, like goodness, partner with librarians, they're fantastic, because <laughs> they love resources and information. So we're excited about this as an opportunity. Um, and we're basing this outreach on 
um, some work we did on career technical education attachment areas, uh, trying to help uh, local career technical education centers understand where the industry compositions are, what the industry compositions are of their local area. Um, and with that, that is the end of my piece. So I will just pause and see if there's questions for me. Otherwise, I will be here for the rest of the discussion. Questions for that? Okay. Then we're going to move to Laura. And Laura has a very unique perspective because she represents hospitals and nursing homes. And one of the things that we saw when we heard from Mary Ann Chan from the, the talent pipeline with the need for a little over 3,900 uh, nurses in the next couple of years, that um, that included a few nursing homes, but not all of them. So we certainly believe that it's probably an even bigger number than what was pointed out in that research. So Laura, we're really excited that you're here today to share with us your perspectives. Well, I'll start by uh, just, just saying it's been a long time since I've been in front of this board, and I really appreciate the opportunity um, my name is Laura Pelosi, for those of you who, who might not know me. And I represent the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, the Vermont Healthcare Association, which is the trade group for long-term care facilities, which includes nursing homes, residential care homes, and assisted living residences. And I also represent Bayauda Home Health. Um, and in that context, certainly we've had um, conversations with Jill Olson at the VNAs to talk about these issues as well. This is across the spectrum um, for, for healthcare providers. And I, I want to really state that I am very appreciative um, that the board is looking at this issue. I've been working for the nursing homes in particular for quite a long time, about a little over a decade, and when I first started working for them, their main issue, my first day on the job, was regulatory agencies. You've got to help us with the regulatory agencies. Today, the number one issue, when I go to any one of our nursing homes, residential care, or assisted living facilities, the number one issue is we cannot get workforce. We are in a crisis. We need to be able to take care of people. So, just kind of piggybacking on um, what Matt was saying in terms of our, our uh, demographic challenges, we've got a stagnant population, an aging state, we're the third oldest state, I'm sad to say I am uh, now slightly over that median <laughs> age. <laughs> um, the percentage of individuals over 65 has increased, and we expect the trends to continue with respect to an aging demographic. This means we have increased demand for health care and long-term services and supports, and yet we have a declining workforce. Um, our data tells us that the labor force has declined by 15,000 workers since 2009. The declining workforce has an especially adverse impact on healthcare providers. You know, it's, I've been spending a lot of time trying to pound the drum on this issue right across the road here uh, in the legislature. And one of the things I frequently hear is, well, we hear this from every sector, every business sector, whether it's retail, whether it's manufacturing, whatever it is. And what I keep saying to legislators and others is, we're not like other industries. This is <coughs> people taking care of people. We can't reduce staff, we can't cut hours, and we can't install a self-checkout kiosk. <laughs> You know, that's, those are a lot of the strategies that a lot of employers and businesses are able um, to employ to deal with the declining workforce. We don't have that, we don't have that flexibility. Telemedicine, you know, things like that are certainly helpful, but at the end of the day, we need people providing care. So we're increasingly left with no choice but to hire agency and traveling nurses to adequately staff operations. And I'll get into um, some detail on the impact of that in a few slides. Some of the data that we've uh, collected uh, in my office on behalf of our group of, of healthcare providers is Board of Nursing Licensing data. You're very familiar, it sounds like, with the Vermont Talent Pipeline Survey. Um, you're very, very familiar with hospital budget submissions. And then uh, the AH, AHS Division on Rate Setting, which is able to give us some data on the um, expenditures in nursing homes for traveling nurse staff. I'm going to show you a series of graphs but, and charts, but I just thought it would be helpful to give you a couple of quick summary points and takeaways um, from these. I'm going to switch to my 
paper because it's easier for me to read. I, I, my mother told me I'd get to a certain point where I need glasses and they seem to need them for everything. She was right. <laughs> so licenses for, for uh, nurses, RNs, uh, APRNs, um, LNAs and LPNs, they run on a two year cycle. Um, takeaways here, the number of new RN licenses declined by 69% from 2007 to 2014. There was a 66% increase in the number of expired RN licenses during the 2012-2013 renewal cycle. And while we've seen a slight uptick in the number of new RN licenses since that period of time, we believe it represents traveling nurses who have to get licensed in order to work in the state of Vermont while they're here. The percentage of new RN licenses with out-of-state addresses has increased from 58% to 86% over this period of time. So that correlation leads us to believe it's the traveling nurse population. And there's been a stark decline in licensed nursing assistant licenses uh, and a significant increase in the number of expired licensed nursing assistant licenses. And those folks are critically important to the daily operations of any healthcare facility, any home health agency, or personal care attendants as well. Um, I'm asking a quick question. Sure. I'm just wondering, I mean, having these traveling nurses come to the state, which we've been hearing a lot about in our uh, board meetings over the years, obviously a problem because they're so much more expensive. Right. Is there any data on the conversion rate of somebody coming here with a traveling nurse with an out-of-state address and the next year filing, or two years later filing, and right. saying, you know, the Vermont Day. Not that we've been able to tease out from the data that's available. We, we looked at that and we can't tell from the data. Um, anecdotally, what we know just from talking to providers is that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, you know, and it's interesting, and it, I've, I've done the rounds with a number of nursing homes on this issue, and they say a lot of them are younger. They like the, the idea that they're able to travel, experience new places, maybe try to figure out where they'd like to you know, to, to dig some roots, so to speak. So I think it's a it's a demographic shift there uh, in terms of the business model. How do I make this the place where they want to yeah. lay down their well, roots? Well, <laughs> that, that's, you know, I think we need to do something to make Vermont a place that is attractive for healthcare providers to come and work here. We did have an anecdotal uh, situation just last week at the UVM breakfast where um, uh, traveling um, nurse practitioner in psychiatry uh, ended up choosing to stay here, and you know, if we had more success stories like that, right. uh, it would be good. It would be great. It, it, it's what we need to do. Obviously, we, we're going to need to bring people into Vermont in order to build this workforce, uh, in order to be successful. So, I won't spend a lot of time. These are just the graphs that demonstrate those takeaways that I was showing you. You'll see the decline in our new licenses, decline. Any licenses? Laura, can I ask a quick question on the RN licenses, yeah. is, on the new licenses? Is there anything that you can attribute to the increase between the 2004-05 and the 2006-07? 2004-05? The big jump? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, so there wasn't like a new loan forgiveness program or anything like that? that I don't know. Done. We haven't dug that deeply yeah. into it. So, yeah. Laura, maybe the answer to that, isn't that about the time, um, I remember du Governor Douglas had the Blue Commission for Health. on uh, uh, nursing, Yeah. and were some of those initiatives maybe what spurred that jump? That, I suppose that's possible, but then there was also, I said, on Governor Shumlin's Commission on Nursing, which would have been after that, um, when we've seen, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that uh, question, but that's a good possibility. Some limitations in the, our ability to explain. But you'll see continued declines and um, increases in the number of expired licenses. So people that are just not renewing their license to practice. And then the percentage of new RNs with out-of-state addresses. Looking at the Vermont talent pipeline, and you know we have a lot of uh, member, certainly hospitals, um, some of the home health agencies, um, and a few of the nursing homes participate in this. 
It was, a, it was an excellent work, pro work product. Um, the survey offers job forecast and demand data for the period of April 2018 to April 2020. And that demand captures two things, and I think Matt, Matt, was, uh, Matt referenced these as the, the two ways you capture that, that forecast. New jobs forecast represents planned or anticipated industry growth. And then replacement jobs forecast represents attrition, turnover, and retirements. So based upon that survey, um, there's a demand for over 3,900 nursing-related positions by April 2020. So quickly approaching. So while you're on that statistic, and, and Matt, if I could draw you into the conversation, because in your chart, you looked at a 10-year period, and it looks like if you add up the 3980 uh, and then go down to uh, nurse practitioners, maybe you're, it, it still seems hard to believe that if the talent pipeline identified 3,900 and they didn't survey everyone, um, is it is this just an immediate demand that levels off, or? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, uh, I've been asked to look at them. Uh, they're such different methodologies um, that they're really difficult to compare. Um, they're, the only thing I can think of is either definitional issues where we're actually looking at um, the occupational code. So while we might have, say, eight different types of nurses, um, or three different types of nurse practitioners. I don't know how their survey was organized, that they might just be saying, what, what are your nursing needs? Or, um, but they, they certainly came up with a much larger number than we did. Our number is based on, um, it starts as a US forecast of all the industry growth for the United States as projected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They provide each state the national model, and then each state uh, takes the national model and calibrates it to our local economy. So um, it, it's for us, because we have such ceilings on our economy, basically, uh, as imposed by population and labor force growth, um, you know, it's difficult for us to get any one piece to get relatively out of scale. Not to say that an employer in the healthcare industry could use all these people, I don't know. Um, but there's going to be a, a growth limitations in our model. Well, that gets to an interesting point, you know, because we've been talking with providers, trying to get a sense of what their needs are. It's actually way more complicated than I thought it was going to be, because I, I'll give you an example. I had one provider say to me, well, 30, 30 vacant positions right now in the nursing professions. And I said, okay. And he said, but, you know, that's just what I reasonably think I might be able to get. I'm not even posting, you know, positions for things I really need to have. He said, I could probably take... 80 to 100, you know, so I think the way they're looking at it on some level is, you know, what do they actually think they might be able to go out and achieve right now versus what they truly might need. So that, that was interesting for me. So, so we're trying to drill down on that a little more. We're not there yet to really kind of capture what that, what that need might be. And this slide just uh, drills down on that pipeline data a little bit to show you where the needs are in, in sort of ranking order for upcoming positions. So RNs at the top uh, and licensed nursing assistants. Again, I can't stress enough um, the critical need in that licensed nursing assistant area. Um, and they identified in ranking order the top eight critical nursing jobs that you see there. And I just want to point out, you know, especially um, working for the hospital association and the nursing home association, the, the top pipeline, it doesn't address the needs of the primary care workforce at the physician level, which is a real challenge. Um, hospitals struggle with this, you know, uh, everyone struggles with the issue of, of attracting physicians. Nursing homes really struggle to even get a medical director or, you know, physicians to come into the building to see patients. They're just not available. They're stretched very thin. Um, it's a real challenge. Nurse practitioners have been um, something that has, you know, alleviated some of that pressure, but I just want to point out that that is also critically important. And the, the pipeline uh, 
report does note that it doesn't address the needs for rehabilitation professionals, PT, OT, SLP. That's a huge area in and of itself. Um, our focus here really is on the nursing professions, but those are also critical areas. And we obviously know um, mental health practitioners, you know, we could use more and more of those as well. It's, it's all part of a bigger effort. So providers are using several strategies to recruit uh, and keep high retention rates, increasing wages, offering sign-on bonuses, referral bonuses, loan repayments, tuition assistance, um, reaching well beyond their geographical region. I've got facilities recruiting Canadian nurses um, who are really challenged to get those work visas processed in an efficient way. That's a lot of work for a facility to try to take on. I've got a provider that's gone as far as Puerto Rico to recruit nurses and highly specialized nurses. There's a lot of time and money that goes into this recruitment effort, um, not to mention nearby states. So uh, I talk with a lot of desperate providers on a daily basis about this issue. So the traveling nurse numbers, and, and you know this very well when it comes to the pressure you're seeing on the hospital budget side, um, but I think a, a, some numbers you're not aware of is what we're seeing on the nursing home side. And I got this data from the Division of Rate Setting at the Agency of Human Services. Um, in FY17, nursing homes spent close to $12 million on traveling nurses. That's a 145% increase from fiscal year 2014, so just in three years. Um, roughly half of Vermont facilities used travelers in, in three years ago, and now we've got over 80% of facilities using traveling nurses. Um, I, I was talking with a provider, a, a nursing home administrator, on Friday, and she said, my family's run these nursing homes for 40 years. I never thought I'd see the day I was gonna have to pick up a phone and call a traveling agency to get nurses into my quality award-winning facility. She said, but we just don't have the people that we need. So, that, you know, in terms of the impact on cost, I think that's pretty clear, the impact on cost that that's having. Um, you know, especially when you're a facility that is 70 plus percent Medicaid, that's an impact to Medicaid. Um, and there's an impact on quality. And that's not to say that traveling nurses are not high quality nurses and that they don't do a good job. But, you know, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a long-term care facility, um, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's a home health agency, you know, they're not incorporated into the culture and climate of the institution. They're not, you know, used to working with that team of folks. It does have an impact on quality. Um, in nursing homes, you know, when I first started working with them, the culture change movement has been huge in nursing homes with the, the idea being that you try to move your care, you know, to look more and more like a home-like environment. You try to address resident need, you know, ahead of time so that they don't have to express need through behaviors that are challenging. And one of the keys to, to being successful with uh, the nursing home population, particularly with dementia and Alzheimer's residents, is consistent assignment of staffing so that they have a, a very limited number of staff that they're interacting with who get to know them really well, who understand their needs, who can anticipate their needs, and can serve them. And when you've got high turnover rates, when you're using traveling nurses, we're not getting, you know, our ability to sustain those efforts um, becomes challenging. So we've kicked around uh, as a group, you know, what might we be able to do? We don't have this, there's not a silver bullet to this, right? This is, this is a national problem, we recognize that. It's a problem across many sectors in Vermont, we recognize that. But we need to do something. Um, so we think about things like financial incentives targeted specifically for healthcare workforce. A few licensing reforms, some educational initiatives, and targeted marketing and recruitment specifically for healthcare workforce. You'll see later, uh, my last slide, we sort of highlight some of the things that are in Governor Scott's budget initiative around workforce, and I think it's great. He's got quite a bit of money going toward workforce initiatives. You know, we would love to see some of those dollars targeted to healthcare workforce. And a lot of the idea is, you know, you're gonna go out and market and bring people to Vermont, but we need to be able to offer them something when, we, when they get here. 
And so that's where you know financial incentives, licensing reforms, and educational opportunity I think come into play so that there's some other reason that they want to come and live and work in Vermont. So on the financial incentives piece, again, tailored toward healthcare workforce, we don't have Yes, we're, we're not claiming we know the answer to this, but other states have done some pretty bold things that won't necessarily be the right step for Vermont, but I think we need to be thinking about the fact that our neighboring states with similar demographics that are very rural, like Maine, are taking some pretty bold action with respect to trying to draw younger people in particular to their state. Um, so we're talking about the Maine uh, Education Opportunity Tax Credit that was enacted in 2008. It is tied to tuition-based um, income credits. Our concern with that is that it wouldn't capture non-degree folks, you know, like our licensed nursing assistants, like our um, personal care attendants, and as you saw in that social assistance category, those people are going to be critical um, if we're going to take care of our aging demographic. So it's not um, necessarily you know, the, golden, the golden nugget, but the point here is other states are doing some, some things that we should be looking at. And also considering employer tax incentives. A lot of employers are providing loan repayment, tuition assistance, you know, they're paying for credentialing, they're paying for you know, um, licensing programs, so to, to help them carry that that burden and to provide those those types of programs, maybe we could do something on the employer side as well. When you look at the main program and you know, that's been in place now for since 2008, yeah. I mean, can you is there any correlation to look at their traveling nurses and seeing you know is, is it a lower percentage or right? So theirs theirs is not geared toward healthcare workforce. They've got a a STEM focus. Um, it didn't start out that way, um, but now they've separated it so they provide um, refundable tax credits for uh, STEM fields and non-refundable tax credits for non-STEM fields, so they've got a slightly different focus. You'll see like Oklahoma, Oregon, they all have a particular sector that they tend to be focused on with their financial incentives. Um, so we haven't looked at it from that perspective. What I can say is that they've expanded, I think, three times since uh, they put it in place in 2008, most recently, I think, in 2016. Uh, and you know, one of, the, one of the concerns that gets raised every time I talk about this is, well, that's a tax expenditure. You know, their dollars, their re it's revenue that the state's not collecting if we're providing a, a tax credit. And, my response to that is they're not, it's not revenue that you're seeing right now. These people are either not here or they're unemployed or underemployed and they're not generating that revenue anyway. So if we can find a way to get them here, get them in good paying, you know, quality jobs over time, they will be contributing to the economic base. That's just my non-economist, non-layman's lobbyist response. <laughs> Some licensing reform. So last year, um, we worked with uh, the administration and the legislature uh, to, to allow for military medics to go straight to licensed nursing assistants based upon their training without having to go through the time and cost of um, the LNA training program. Some other states have had have similar programs in place for LPNs. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about are a bridge or apprenticeship program for our military medics to LPN, just to try to put some more qualified folks into this workforce. Um, and we do, we need to join the Interstate Nurse Licensure Compact. I'm hoping we're gonna do that this year. That allows for reciprocity across states for our nurses. That would help, hopefully. Uh, Things that you, you, I'm sure, hear all over the place. Strengthen loan repayment programs. Increase the number of admissions into nursing programs. To do that, we need nurse educators. Um, a lot of what I hear is that, that um, our nursing programs don't necessarily have the master's level RNs that they need um, to teach the number of folks who would like to enroll in those programs. And I think we need to promote the value of the LPN and the ADM programs, which are, um, you know, sort of career ladders to an RN. You know, we've got a lot of folks, particularly in nursing homes. Nursing homes run on LPNs and LNAs, um, you know, and these folks are working. They often have, you know, families and young children, and it's 
tough for them to, to pursue a four-year degree. So we need to, I think, do a better job of marketing the value of that LPN scope of practice. Identify and remove barriers to accessing educational programs. Um, some of the prerequisites to LPN programs coming out of high school can be somewhat challenging. I think we just need to take a look at that. Um, and then again, we've got the, the life work school balance issues. We need some more online offerings, probably. Um, and again, some of these career ladder type programs to allow some, some of these folks some greater opportunities to access nursing programs. And then really market Vermont healthcare career opportunities. But again, I feel like if we're not providing some of these other reasons for folks to want to join the healthcare workforce, we're not going to be as successful as we could because they're really hard jobs. Um, and then again, this is, I think it's, uh, and Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if I've got them all here, but uh, these are the ones that we've identified in going through the budget. It comes close to $9 million. Um, and I think this is great, um, you know, recruitment grants and contracts, regional relocation and recruitment initiatives, but again, I feel like there's got to be a reason for somebody to want to come here and be a nurse over somebody, you know, over wanting to go anyplace else to be a nurse, or Maine, where they might have um, the Maine Opportunity Tax Credit Program help them on their state income tax. So I just feel like we need to find a way to distinguish ourselves and make ourselves be more appealing for healthcare providers to want to come here. That is the end of my presentation. Uh, so I'm just curious um, which way the tide is flowing here and whether um, uh, this is, in terms of your experience, you know, Canada, Puerto Rico, neighboring states trying to entice people into Vermont, um, is, uh, are, are these other states, my impression is that these other states are in the same situation. This is a, at least regional or national issue. And so that as we ratchet up our programs, other folks are ratcheting up their programs. And are we just kind of um, uh, not getting any kind of relative advantage? That would be one question. And the other is, what, what does the grapevine say of people who are leaving healthcare, uh, not renewing their licenses, a 66% rate. Uh, um, what do they say? Is it? Is it? Are they saying it's just not worth it? It's not a good place to work, or is it demographic? Um, you know, what kind of message are they passing down among their individual networks uh, um, that might um, uh, set a tone about uh, a negative tone about working in these. So I guess I'll start with that one. And I mean, I, I work with and talk to a lot of nurses every day. Um, it is an aging workforce. There's no question about that. And I, I don't have the data to sort of back up, you know, the what's happening with the expiration of licenses. But my strong suspicion is they're retiring largely. Um, you know, I just I saw emails from seven uh, facilities, you know, this week saying our, you know, director of nursing, you know, is, is retiring by the end of 2020. So we know that that's a demographic challenge with the nursing population. During the recession, a lot of them stayed on work, you know, worked longer, like, like a lot of people did. And so I think we're starting to see that, that impact of sort of pent up retirements waiting to happen on some level. Um, but by and large, I, I have yet to meet a nurse that doesn't say what a wonderful profession it is. So I, I don't think it's that they're sending negative messages. I think um, shift work is a challenge, particularly for younger folks. Um, I think you know a lot of a lot of folks don't want to work third shift or second shift. I mean, I grew up in a house with a mom who worked second shift in the hospital for 42 years. Sometimes third shift, you know, that's you know, worked for our family. My dad was home at night, my mom was home during the day. You know, there was always a parent on, you know, on top of us. But that doesn't work for, for every family, particularly uh, if you're a single working mother, um, which we see a lot of, um, you know, in, in the nursing profession. So I think there are a lot of um, just lifestyle considerations there as well. Um, with respect to your first question, 
um, if I've got this right. You know, we'll never know until we try, I guess is my response. Um, if, you know, if we continue to walk the path we're walking and not try to do something bold, we're never going to know if we're going to be successful. We're never going to know if we should be losing hope. I'd like to think we're not going to lose hope. Um, and I'd like to think that Vermont can distinguish itself in some way because of our quality of life. If we can combine that um, with some, <coughs> some financial and educational opportunities for people, I think we have a decent chance at success. Okay. Um, so, Laura, thank you. This is helpful. And I just, this is probably the typical economist question. You're talking to a lawyer. So. Well, that's okay. <laughs> but, but you offer several solutions, and they all sound really interesting. And there's different costs associated with each of them, right? Some of them require monetary outlays. Some of them are tax revenue not coming in. Some of them are just legislative changes on licensing. Right. So different costs. And I'm wondering, um, presumably, they also have potentially different impacts on the labor force. So is there any analysis that's being done to help figure out how you how to prioritize these potential initiatives in terms of what's going to be most cost effective? Yeah, you know, we've, we've looked around and kind of kicked around and done a little bit of our own research. You know, we don't feel like we're necessarily in the best position to do that. You know, what, what we're trying to do really is say, here, we are at a critical point. We need to bring together the policy experts. You know, we need to bring together the tax experts, the financial <laughs> folks, the economists to help us figure out the best path forward. So the role that we've taken on behalf of the providers is to say, this is really important and you can't not pay attention to it. But I don't necessarily know what is the most effective you know, tax policy that we should or shouldn't have in place or where we're gonna get the greatest bang for our buck. I can just tell you based upon chatting with providers, these are some of the things that their staff say to them. You know, these are the things that matter to them. And when you start talking about personal care attendants and licensed nurses' aides and LPNs, there are even bigger nuts to crack around child care, affordable housing, and transportation. You know, those are all elements of what makes it challenging in a rural state um, to get health care work for. So I don't know where we're going to get our biggest bang for the buck. I don't know what's most effective. I wish I did. Go ahead, Tom. This is going to be a risky comment. But um, so I'm looking at the numbers here in the, in the uh, governor's proposal, and it's somewhere around $10 million. And as I've kind of come to know hospital budgets, um, I see that there is, um, there is free care in hospital budgets. I think that's like $45 million bucks a year. And the bad debt is close to $79 million a year. But um, a lot of that is because that's charge master numbers. Um, it's something lower than that. But it, it's, you know, and I've mentioned this to a few people, and I'll just offer it up publicly and take the negative feedback if I have to. Um, but the state has a program called the Offset Program, which allows, and state, states use it very much. I mean, Vermont uh, agency state, uh, ESAC, uh, VITA, um, folks at AHS, they use this to collect bad debts. And I'm just wondering if some kind of connection could be made here in terms of helping to raise money for this purpose at the hospital level um, by having um, hospitals which are, whose budgets are regulated by the state mm -hmm. be eligible to participate in this well-established program. I mean, this is a program that's been around for years. Um, it works very well. And, um, and my guess is that uh, some good, healthy portion of that $79 million in bad debt could be collected um, through that process and used to um, help help the cause you know, that, 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 you're, that you're making there. Um, I mean, I know there's arguments about that. People, you know, there is free care. People will say, oh, we don't want to go after somebody that's not paying their deductible or their copay. But what that means is somebody else is paying their 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 or co -pay. And um, I just think it's an asset that the Defender General uses, um, child support uses, um, it's a, and it's an asset that you folks might be able to use to help raise a significant amount of money in the context of the numbers I see here. Thank you. I, I had not thought about that. I'll definitely put it on the, I've written it down, and I will take it back to the Hospital Association and get their thoughts around that. 
Okay, thank you, Laura. Thanks. So, so next on the panel, we have uh, one of my old dear friends. <laughs> and I'll tell you that um, when you're a legislator, it's hard enough to get anything through your own chamber. You didn't have to worry that the other chamber will even take it up. And I can tell you that uh, looking back uh, on some of the uh, bills that uh, we were able to get passed, it was so great to uh, be working with Sarah, whether it was early childhood education or <coughs> bills or what have you, because you knew that um, the job would get done. So, Sarah, we're lucky to, to have you uh, working on the workforce issue. And well, thank you, thank you, and the feeling was mutual. to miss working uh, with you in that way, but maybe we have a new way of working together here. There you go. Um, I'm going to start just briefly because I, I, am, I, I don't know how much you know about um, the capacity for the Vermont Department of Labor to contribute to this problem or to the solutions to this problem. So I just want to just let you know that um, I'm Sarah Buxton. I am the Director of Workforce uh, Policy and Performance in the Department of Labor. It was a position that was created about a year and a half ago. Um, to really work on labor force expansion issues for Governor Scott. Um, and part of my role has been to look at the resources available to the Department of Labor and uh, all of the employment and training programs, uh, particularly the federal ones that come in across um, the state, and see how we can uh, better blend and braid federal resources and the goals of those programs to support the labor force needs in the state. Um, at the Department of Labor, we are 98% federally funded. Um, so there's, there are limitations to what we can do. But I am happy to tell you that today I'm going to um, give you some ideas about um, initiatives that we're working on that some are funded, some are not funded, and they're just gonna be uh, partnerships with different organizations, some of which are represented here, to try to chip away at this, um, this issue. And to Dr. Holmes, is there, Dr. Holmes' <coughs> point about what is the return on investment, I think um, uh, it took me maybe about two weeks, so it was a little bit of time to move from a legislative role where you like to really think about process things and like analyze whether or not you're making the best decision to being on the executive side where um, I think what we, what we realize with this labor force challenge is there's no wrong path to getting better. Um, we, have to, we, we have to pick a path, and if someone else wants to say, you know, I think if you move over in this direction, you could get more bang for your buck. Um, I know that at least in our department, and I could probably speak on behalf of the administration, where we welcome um, that advice, but what we don't want to do is um, continue to stall for lack of wondering which direction to go. So it, this is particularly relevant to this conversation because I don't know of one occupation or one um, employer who would say, nah, put me at the end of the line. You know, like, they're all clamoring for support here. So uh, with that, I'm going to give uh, you a few slides that are just an overview on how we're approaching the labor force challenge, and then I'm going to um, identify for you some of the strategies that we're implementing and try to highlight the ones that are related to healthcare uh, labor force. So as you know, the governor's top priority um, has been for the last few years to grow and strengthen the labor force, um, and he is... Uh, directing all of his agencies to work together. Last year in August, I began pulling together an interagency team um, across all of state government to begin working on labor force issues and um, seeing if we can't better align and um, support one another's programs. And, and we are making significant headway on all those fronts. The very specific goal is to increase not only the number, but the skill level of available workers in Vermont. And there are three ways, even though uh, it says one, one, and one, there are three ways to achieve that, although they, I guess that represents that there are in no particular order, they're all important. Um, the first is to increase the labor participation rate within the state of Vermont, 
And so Matt touched on that earlier in his presentation, and Laura, well, actually Laura touched on all of these points um, in her remarks as well. So we have some strategies that are related to um, trying to support Vermonters or residents here in the state in participating in the labor force, overcoming barriers, um, attaining the skill level that they need, the credentials they need to become employed, to meet those employers, and to have employers be willing to hire um, different types of workers. Um, the second strategy uh, that a lot of our activities fall under is to recruit and relocate more workers to Vermont. So I'm excited to tell you in a little bit some of the activity around that. I just want to highlight that our plan in front of the legislature this year and our, the way that we're talking about this particular strategy is to emphasize that it isn't just recruiting, but it's also relocating. So to someone's point about the traveling nurses, um, I think what we found in learning from other states and learning from um, some private headhunter-like firms is that you can attract someone to a position or, or to a place, but there is a separate process that takes place in that decision making to actually take action and, and move or to take the job. And so um, at the Department of Labor, we see our role um, along the lines of the relocating part because we have some expertise in um, employment supports and other referrals to support services. And we also have built a, a pretty strong network with uh, partners for everything from childcare to transportation. So we're proposing that the activities are both recruiting for positions and for people, and then having a singular uh, support mechanism to help relocate those individuals uh, to Vermont, wherever that may be. Um, and then the third is assisting employers in accessing and retaining qualified workers. So that again, it reflects, I think, a change in both of our approach. Um, for a long time, we had very, um, well, we had higher unemployment rates, and so employers had a different approach to um, accessing workers. Now with very low unemployment rates, um, workers are in higher demand, and we have an aging workforce, so retaining qualified workers and paying attention to what um, mature workers need is certainly something that we're working with employers on. So in trying to address all of those strategies, we're doing everything that you would think one would be doing at var with varying levels of energy and success. Um, I talked a little bit about an interagency um, labor force expansion plan that we launched last fall, and uh, make, we've ticked off some successes there. We've made some uh, progress in trying to um, identify discrete initiatives that can help um, move the needle forward. We're trying to target investments, both state and federal resources, specifically on labor force expansion. Um, the training, uh, when we talk about workforce in general, it, there are many different parts of building a workforce. There's the, um, the educating component, there's an identifying component, which is like identifying and recruiting. There's a matching component. There's an upskilling component. And then there's a retention component. And so activities in state and federal programs, private and public programs, sometimes touch and overlap on all those different uh, pieces. And so trying to help everyone know where uh, expertise exists or where um, will exists among public and private partners has been really important to try to, uh, uh, like I said, make some headway in the outcomes. Focusing our priorities, coordinating efforts, aligning our work, um, engaging partners, understanding where employers' needs are is important, but again, um, whether it's the talent pipeline data that says we need X number of nurses, or it's Bureau of Labor Statistics data um, that says we need Y number of nurses. We know we need nurses, and so uh, and we know we need them in hospitals and in other private care settings. So I think our job is to is to get nurses and figure out how to bring all those partners together uh, to find some sort of collective impact. 
Okay, so strategy number one was increasing the labor force participation rate of Vermonters. So this is, these are activities inside the state and they're most likely gonna be around training and removing barriers to employment. Um, what I've done is I've highlighted a couple of the ones that I think are most uh, relevant to our conversation around healthcare. So uh, in uh, Rutland County, two years ago, the Department of Labor funded a pilot project to see what it could look like to do some career coaching in Mill River and in um, Otter Valley and see if we could help build bridges between students who were in, and still enrolled in high school but weren't planning to go on to college and put them into uh, <coughs> opportunities right in Rutland County. And luckily there's a great partner there, uh, Rutland Regional Hospital, who is working with the local um, Workforce Investment Board and the RDC to support this Real Careers in Rutland County uh, program. We're gonna be funding it again and uh, for one more year until we figure out, well, we're working on a sustainability plan, but they are looking to expand to other high schools. So we're trying to see if this career coaching um, is, is something that can help us find workers for jobs that exist right in uh, the local communities in the state. Expanding adult training opportunities at CTE centers. This is another area where we've invested a, more money um, in the Department of Labor through the WEC Fund, which is the Workforce Education and Training Fund. Uh, this year in the governor's budget, not only is there over a million dollars in new funding for non-degree grants, uh, but we've also increased um, our support from the Department of Labor's perspective for, for infrastructure at adult CTE centers. Um, I believe every adult CTE center has an LNA program, um, and they're always looking for funding. One of the ways that we've also began to narrow our priorities is to um, limit, when we put out our RFP for these small grants, is to limit the categories of training. And so this year it's limited to healthcare, construction, manufacturing, um, transportation, and business services. So that's one way we've started to narrow down, um, or begin to focus on our priorities. You may not know about returnships, but this was another program that came out of the last legislative session. A returnship is like an internship in that it's a limited duration, um, on-the-job work experience, but instead of uh, being for someone who's new to working, like a typical college, you know, maybe a post-secondary in, uh, internship might be, this is for someone who um, is returning to the workforce or is changing their careers. So this is everyone from a veteran to a parent who's taking time off to raise some kids or uh, taking some time off to take care of a, a, a relative or has been in prison or has um, been in recovery. And so these are opportunities to work with employers to help people get back into the workforce. Again, just um, uh, removing some of those barriers. So for any employer right now, this program has just launched officially in the last um, six weeks. For any employers who are interested in offering these experiences, um, work with the Department of Labor, we'll get you hooked up and we'll see if we can start getting folks in for a returnship and you may find that the, these individuals are people you wanna offer a full-time job to. Skipping down just to the highlighted ones, um, we already noted the importance of um, ensuring that we have child and elder care. So you'll see that elder care is both a, a workforce need just in general because we need, we need everybody in the labor force. Um, so having someone come leave the labor force to take care of a, uh, someone in their family is difficult. But in addition, we need more people taking care of older people in the work in that specific occupational um, uh, space. So we've talked a little bit about Vermont college graduates. We're still struggling with how to best help Vermont college graduates stay here. We've turned our internship program on its head a little bit and focused the performance more on the number of um, jobs that are offered at the end of the internship program. I think formally internships were viewed as an opportunity to just do some job exploration. And so we're trying to focus our dollars on um, 
Um, having those internships mean something in terms of offering a job and using that as a pipeline for some employers. Before the grants went out this year, I did touch base with some of the um, home health and hospice um, organizations around the state and visiting nurses. And I believe we had a few applications to try to support the college graduates who were moving into that field. Um, the biggest piece of news I think I have for you today is the progress we've made since I last saw you on expanding apprenticeship opportunities. We applied for and received a grant from the federal government in May um, to increase the number of um, apprentices in the state in partnership with CCB and BTC. Um, we applied for six. We're writing a modification to get a seventh. Of those, um, three of them are in the healthcare field. So, no, four of them are, because we're changing one. So, um, you'll be happy to know we're developing with BTC an LPN apprenticeship. Um, we are developing a medical assistant apprenticeship um, through CCB, and that's modeled after the program they had um, piloted with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Um, and we are offering a Oh, CVS, um, CVS Pharmacy has um, internships in all of our New England state, or apprenticeships in all of the New England states in, in a variety of different ways. We're using um, a model that Rhode Island used, and we're expanding pharmacy tech apprenticeships um, with CVS as our employer sponsor. Um, we're very interested in, in continuing to expand apprenticeship opportunities. So I think if we were to talk about initiatives um, moving forward, uh, Yale has an interesting program for RNs, an apprenticeship model where you may um, get a certificate which is similar to uh, an endorsement that would need to be recognized by hospitals or by employers, but um, to be able to train higher level nurses on the job, um, that's something that we're looking at and seeking funding. We're waiting right now for the federal government to announce what the next round of apprenticeship funding is going to be. We think that it will probably be formula funding, which will change a little bit our approach to how we expand apprenticeships in the state. Um, but again, I, I can't tell you how important it is for us to be working with employers in this realm, because I, understanding what a, a good quality apprenticeship program is, um, is really important to ensuring that those opportunities are successful and yield um, quality employees down the line. And so I already mentioned um, increasing funding for tuition and cost of non-degree credentials. So that's a sampling of the in-state sort of training opportunities that we have. Uh, before I go to the next slide, does anyone want to talk about other strategies for supporting the workforce in-state that, or make recommendations for things that you thought you would see here and you don't see? I had one thought, but I'm not sure which bucket it falls yeah. in. But it's a thought actually when Chair Mullen mentioned Green Mountain College. And I thought, um, you know, as that institution is closing with probably some significant high skilled labor force there, I was wondering is there any effort that's made to go in there and say, hey, we want to, you've already made an investment in Vermont, you're building up connections in Vermont. How do we redeploy you in the state so you don't go to New Hampshire or right. Massachusetts? And so I was just wondering as larger institutions are reducing their workforce or closing all together. Is there, and I'm not sure that falls into this bucket or another bucket. Well, no, it, it, it can. I think this is the one because it's in-state and it's yeah. re retaining people here. Um, we, we did send our staff down this week to meet with um, Green Mountain College. I do understand that there is some partnership with Castleton to, uh, for some of the students. Um, I think one of the important things in higher education, and this, this does fall in an organizational role for the Department of Labor under WIOA, the Workforce Opportunity, or Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act. We're supposed to coordinate these career pathways. Um, and a, in a recent trip down to Castleton, I did meet with a new president and um, understood some of the programs that they were looking to expand and um, was pleased to learn about her connections with UVM and other uh, other training providers up and down the career pathway. So I introduced her to some folks at Stafford Technical Center so that she could sort of have a pipeline of some workers and trying to align that. 
But we also wrote Castleton College into a, a, another grant we were doing to try to promote better return to work outcomes uh, for muscular skeletal injuries in our workers' compensation division. So we received that. We hopefully can work with Castleton and any other partner that they have um, to be able to put more resources into things like occupational therapy, physical therapy assistance, um, and any other type of program they want to develop in the healthcare world. That doesn't really answer your Green Mountain College issue, but I'll say <laughs> stay tuned, you have set staff. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer to yeah. another question that's helpful. But yeah, I was just wondering how do you retain the workers that may be being laid off within Vermont? Well, if there if it's workers that are being re um, that are being um, laid off, we have rapid we have federal rapid response dollars, and those are incredibly valuable to us. We can both do layoff aversions, but then we can also very quickly go in and help um, get folks new jobs. We can also, if the layoff is due to um, uh, it's become certified as an action that resulted from a difference, a change in the trade, um, the Federal Trade Act permits us to, to go and help laid off workers retrain for new jobs, and there's some significant funding there. We don't have a lot of those instances. Um, Yankee was the last one that I can really recall, but. Right. Thank you, that yeah. was helpful. So the second strategy is the one you've been hearing a lot about lately. Um, recruit and relocate more workers to Vermont. So I want to I started talking about this first initiative that can that can cost money or it cannot cost money, depending on how we proceed with this. Wisconsin has recently dis discovered that if they send employers to military bases when um, the service members are separating, and those employers are willing to make job offers on the spot, that they are finding some success with those military members and potentially their families moving back to those states and taking those jobs. And so working with our Jobs for Veterans um, staff in the Department of Labor, we looked around at some of the bases in the country. And as you may know, Fort Hood has a high percentage of medical professionals that are trained in Fort Hood. And I think they have somewhere around like 80,000 um, service members in and around the base that includes their families. And so I've started, uh, met with the, designate, the HR directors for the designated agencies last week, and I've floated this idea just recently to Laura to maybe work with some of her associations. And um, again, we just have to try something and see if it works. But trying to work with some of these organizations who are able to make a job offer on the spot, or at least come really close, and work with our National Guard, who's also interested in doing some re um, recruitment, and going on to basis, whether it's Fort Hood or Benning or Campbell, they all seem to be the name of senators um, for Trump, um, and going to see if we can uh, recruit some of those folks to come to Vermont. So that is something we're going to try in terms of funding. One of the designated agencies, their HR director said to me, you know, for the, for the flight down to Texas in an overnight hotel stay, um, even if I didn't get a single bite, it probably, I would be no worse off than placing yet another ad in seven days and getting no responses. So to me, that sort of made me think, well, maybe we can just do this without, you know, sort of organically and try a grassroots effort to see if this works. Um, if that sounds interesting to any of you or to anyone in the room and you, you say, I want to get in on that, um, I'm starting a team, so <laughs> we're going to do that. Last year, we expanded the availability of in-state college tuition to members of the Guard. Um, and as I noted, I noted the on-base employment events. Um, and Laura already mentioned reducing barriers to occupational licensing. We did make some headway last year, but I still think finding those discrete issues and those problem areas um, is something that we can take and work with um, the legislature and OPR and others on trying to um, mitigate those barriers. The other under-targeted outreach and recruitment campaign, um, we're looking to work with our partners at ACCD to do some targeted recruiting with the help of actual healthcare professionals who know what would be um, an attractive tactic in uh, 
recruiting healthcare professionals. Uh, but we would like to try to, to target some of the uh, college campuses and the high concentration healthcare workforce areas potentially in Massachusetts and in New York. And we'll see if that makes a difference. It's something we can track a little bit better, actually going out and trying to um, physically recruit a person and bring them here. Uh, relocation assistance, I, I mentioned that the Department of Labor feels like we could be really supportive in uh, an effort we're calling Relocato2, um, where anyone, whether you're a um, by state primary and you found someone that you um, have recruited for a uh, hospital for, for a position, and they may have a, um, a spouse or a partner um, who's coming with them, and you really don't know how to help them find a job, uh, the Department of Labor can sort of set up a, a system of being able to help by providing labor market information, other types of valuable information at the local level, information on schools and taxes and house sale values, um, and see if we can't help you make that whole move complete. In addition, um, there are a variety of incentives that were offered last year for remote workers. Uh, the governor's proposal is to expand that to people who aren't just working outside the state, but we're moving to Vermont to work inside the state. So there are some incentives before the legislature now for them to consider. Um, that kind of describes the activities around recruiting and relocating more workers to Vermont. Are there things that you see that strike you or that you are surprised that you don't see on that list? So Sarah, as you know, sometimes I'm very slow. Okay. So I, I didn't wanna, know that. I want to answer your question, uh, but I'm going back to strategy one. Yes. Because I think that we're missing a key component in that we have a false narrative in the state of Vermont. And the narrative is that in order to achieve a successful career, you have to leave the state. And we know that's not true because we know, for example, in healthcare, that these are good paying jobs with good benefits that will allow you to have a good career. And you'll be happy in your career because you're always helping others. And you'll be able to retire with dignity. So the strategy I don't see on here is reaching out, and I think it has to start in middle school, working with guidance counselors to start to um, get Vermont's youth thinking of the possibilities within our borders rather than believing that they have to leave to be a success. That's great. I, I will add that to the list. We are about to change one of those, you'll be familiar with it, but we're going to ask for a waiver um, in the use of our WIOA funds. It, we, we're supposed to use 75% on out-of-school youth, 25% um, on in-school youth. We're looking for a waiver to bump that down to 60 because we have a high high school graduation rate in the state of Vermont that allows us to go in with resources like that into schools while, while students are still in school and be able to start to do some of that work along with the uh, work-based learning coordinators and others. Um, that isn't, hasn't taken structure yet. The, the uh, approval hasn't been granted, but I'm going to add that to the list so that we don't forget to keep coming back to that. Great. Okay, anybody have some help on strategy too? <laughs> um, I'm going to skip strategy three and come back to it because Ina has to leave and I want to give her a chance to talk because we've talked a lot. Um, <laughs> so after Ina speaks, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit on strategy three and then just the healthcare related initiatives and that's all I had left. So I'm going to let you just speak. Okay, so great. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry that I have to scurry off. Um, what I think is really exciting is what, uh, something that we've been working on, um, Sarah, myself, and others, um, to talk about how what has been a separate and distinct work group, the healthcare workforce work group, can be enfolded into the larger uh, workforce development initiatives in the state and um, specifically the State Workforce Development Board. If what we envision is a way that the healthcare uh, workforce work group can, can perform or behave as a subcommittee of that board with those um, connections being 
stronger. Um, the connections of, of the initiatives and the um, priorities of that work group, which would be a, a committee or perhaps a task force, um, and how, the, how they would be married to the broader overall workforce development um, efforts. And I think that's very exciting because as you fully appreciated today, um, healthcare is very much a driver in our economy. It's a growth sector um, and it is, uh, it should be appreciated as a part of the, the broader workforce. And, and that's really what I'm excited to talk about and, and share with you. Um, it, and we can we can talk more about that now if you have questions about what that's going to look like. It's um, kind of a slow uh, trans uh, transition, but I I'm very excited for it to be realized. My first question would be: since you're in charge of the, the healthcare workforce plan, what's the timing? When will we see a revised one? That's a great. Uh, the, that is a good question, and I don't I can't give you an answer for that right now yeah. I have an idea so my world my world is in the state workforce development board somewhat although I, I'm not the executive director that's another person um, the the workforce one when Ian and I were talking about this the state workforce development board has to every four years put out a state workforce plan and our plan is due to the feds in 2020 and one of the things that I think is really important in bringing, having the governor bring the healthcare workforce uh, work to the state workforce board, nominate some members of the healthcare commu community, and then charge the board with addressing some of the priorities of the plan, is that um, this will help ensure that components of the healthcare specific um, priorities can be included in the overall statewide workforce plan that will come out uh, February, I think the first draft we're charged with having ready by February 28th of next year, so just about 13 months from now. Um, if, the board, if this board would be interested in particular parts of that, I think we would be very open to uh, receiving those recommendations or some of those charges and ensuring that specific priorities are addressed in that planning process and in any other type of uh, planning process that this healthcare committee would have on the board to report on regularly or to take action on. Um, so I guess I, I would pass the buck to Robin because it's my understanding that there's a requirement for a separate health workforce plan and that at some point this board would have to approve it. Am I wrong? No, there is a statute that requires um, a work, healthcare workforce strategic plan that is proposed by uh, AOA, I think it says in the statute, but now I think that would be AHS, um, to the, this board for approval. But I think, it, I think you could accomplish that same objective um, by having a unified planning process. You just have to, I think you would have to be willing to go through this separate step to meet that statutory requirement and to fulfill both, um, both requirements. So, I mean, I don't know what the requirement, the federal requirements are for you and whether that there's a conflict there, but I could see how you certainly could unify that planning and I think it makes a lot of sense given the focus now on workforce generally uh, to ensure that the healthcare priorities are unified and incorporated into that focus. I also think it has, whereas the healthcare workforce development strategic plan doesn't have a, re a date for it to be re renewed or revised, if we are to be in a, a marriage, so to speak, with the overall workforce development initiatives, then um, that is a, that's a great avenue for us to make sure that we're refreshing that kind of planning, whereas the plan now is I'm sure you're interested in when it's going to be renewed because it's kind of static. Um, and What's then, the date of the existing plan? I believe it's 2013. 2013, yeah. Yeah, the workforce work group is working on revisions, but those revisions, I think, never really get completed to the point that it came to this board. The other value that I really see in that is when we do workforce activity, 
Um, I'll be honest, if you saw, I, I stopped on the employer um, bucket, but we, do, we aren't really, I think, I don't think we're including employers in our workforce conversations as much. We tend to gravitate toward um, <coughs> retail, hospitality, manufacturing, construction, um, and I, I know why there are some tensions there in terms of the, the impact on the economy, but it, it, from someone who's trying to, from the position of those who are trying to change the system, it's hard to have one set of conversations to say this is really important and then have another set of conversations about what's really important and then what's happening is we aren't making progress anywhere because they haven't prioritized and had to have that hard, uh, had to have that hard conversation about what comes first. So, more for Ina. Does anybody want to ask Ina anything before she has to leave? Or? No. Okay. Thank you, Ina. Thank you. I'll just say that I'm happy once we formalize the relationship, we can come back and talk about that and what that structure looks like and what our expectations are. Sure. All right. Three. I talked about most of these, but I'm going to touch on one or two little pieces just so that you know that they're happening. Um, I talked about targeting workforce education and training funds. Um, even in making those awards right now on statute, we're supposed to be, uh, the Department of Labor consults with the State Workforce Development Board. Having the healthcare uh, voice there at the table would be another example of where, when decisions about targeting funds, uh, where they could really add some value. We talked about expanding apprenticeships. Um, so building employer coalitions for recruitment, um, the, the idea that many in many industries there are industry organizations that are focused really well on, on training for their participant members. I'm thinking about um, the Association of General Contractors, for example, um, AGC, AGC, yeah. And so with some of the healthcare employers, especially recently, We've sort of talked with them about formalizing the way that they are uh, coming together so that they're easier for us to work with as the state um, in some of these recruitment um, initiatives. So for example, if we're, if we're going to be build, building a video, an outreach video, whether it's to middle school kids or it's for something that we're going to put on a Facebook ad down around Mass General Hospital, um, having some input from a coalition if we're targeting uh, a particular demographic is, is important and useful for us. Um, the direct employer assistance with posting and recruiting, we've just, uh, I've discovered in the last six to nine months that a lot of employers don't realize that they have some free resources at the Department of Labor. So we've instructed our staff to start compiling um, some lists because again, employers usually are the ones who are uh, thought of in the community as um, uh, your manufacturing industries. So I think this is this is going to make a little, hopefully, a little bit of a difference. Um, we're also trying to impress upon employers the importance of putting a salary in their advertising. Um, it, we find that a lot of job seekers are unaware of what they could be making. Um, in these advertisements, so uh, with a little bit of coaching and help from us, we think maybe we can get some a little bit of attraction there. Career pathway <coughs> development. Um, I I also wanted to highlight that we are aware of a need to be even more um, mindful of how we work with higher education and the state colleges, particularly, and the degrees and the credentials that they're offering that employers are in need of. Um, so in some cases, there are credentials that are only offered at Northern Vermont University, but that's really difficult when the credential is needed down in Brattleboro. Um, so trying, part of our role, the Department of Labor, is to uh, facilitate the development of those career pathways, and that includes having the conversation at both ends. Ina talked about the Governor's Healthcare Workforce Task Force, um, and again, I already mentioned expanding returnships in the state. And then the parting question I have is, what's the case for prioritizing healthcare workforce recruitment and retention efforts and resources? 
it's a it, this is about finding the will. I think we've we've all decided there's a there's an issue here, but others are also competing for the same resources and the same um, individuals in the labor force. And so I think our collective challenge is to is to really hone in on what our case is, um, and then identify the resources that we need in the state and become really clear about that. They don't have to be the perfect resource. Some more training is better than no training. So that's what I have. So are you looking for an answer? <laughs> yeah, do you have one? So what's the case for prioritizing healthcare workforce? And, um, since Jill Olson is in the crowd, I'll, I'll quote uh, my friend Ron Chop at the PNAs and Hospice of the Southwest Region, who always would say to me when I was a legislator that sooner or later, uh, I'm gonna get your tired old butt, and I'm paraphrasing now because he wasn't quite as, quite as nice with his language. Um, but the reality is, is that healthcare affects each and every one of our lives. And um, I would argue that in some ways, and I never want to make an argument against another industry because, of course, we need economic development across the spectrum. But if you're making a widget, it may not impact each and every one of us sitting in this room. But if you're providing healthcare, it is eventually going to impact each and every one of us in this room. And so it's about taking care of us. And so I would say that um, I believe it's the highest priority in workforce. Kevin, I would also chime in and say that I think Matt's charts early in the presentation about the employment by sector and the slope of those lines make a pretty compelling case that out of the sectors in Vermont that are increasing, uh, healthcare is increasing as fast, if not faster, than the rest. Uh, so it is going to be an area of great need, and I bet if you compared salaries uh, as well, the salaries in healthcare for many, not all, of course, uh, would be significant. So that I would chime in with those arguments. You know, the argument that the response to that that I've heard, I'm not saying I'm making the response, but I'm offering the response, which is that healthcare doesn't have the same market pressure. Um, there's always going to be demand, or there's all, yes, there's always going to be demand, and so even if we try to meet the demand, there will be increased demand, and it would only be someone like the Green Mountain Care Board that had, would have the, the power to change the pressure in that direction. Which um, we are doing. <laughs> right, right, under, totally understood. And I think that may account for some of the variation, too, in the the surveys that went out through the Vermont Talent Pipeline. I mean, the, the reality is if you ask me how many people I'd like to hire in the Department of Labor, state policies aside, you know, I, I would give you a number, but then when I have my appropriation um, and things have to be tweaked, that, that the reality of those hires is, is different also. Um, and the, these are the conversations we, I think we have to wrestle with, and it's the, those are the ones that having Having that at the state level, at the state workforce development board level, or in a committee room, they need to happen at the same time. Yeah. But keep in mind that if we are not able to provide an adequate workforce in healthcare, someone could ultimately die. So I'll just keep hitting home that point. I, I just wanted to add, you know, one of the one of the issues that we're consistently facing across the continuum, right, is right here at the right place at the right time. And if you're in a hospital and you're ready to be discharged and a nursing home can't admit you because they don't have the staffing levels to take care of you or a home health agency can't staff the services that they need to staff at home because they don't have the people, you know, that's some, someone sitting in a hospital when they don't need to be there or someone sitting in a nursing home that could go home but the home health agency can't respond. I mean, there, there are so many impacts from not having an adequate level of staffing from a quality of care perspective to a cost perspective. And so I don't want to lose sight of that. And when we're paying travelers 200% of what it would cost to employ a Vermonter, there's a huge economic impact on Vermonters because that's a driving force on the cost of health care. I would just add one more thing in prioritizing, you know, these fields is that you, know, you can't attract people to come to the state in other fields if they think the quality of healthcare is not good. 
you know, so that, that's something that, you know, would at least say, hey, if I want to get people here, I need to make sure that there's quality help here. And then, you know, one other thing I think you could try to do in some of your recruitment tactics is really looking at trailing spouses as well. So really showing that, you know, there are employment opportunities for everyone in the family when they come here. So if you're targeting health care but their spouse is working in something else, you know, how do we attract that? Because that's, that's always a, been an issue, um, you know, certainly on the corporate side to attract people was what was their spouse going to do? when they get here, and so having support in order to be able to place another person as well, you know, is really important. I'm just going to echo that. I'm sitting on two search committees, one for uh, computer science at Middlebury College and one for economics at Middlebury College, so I've interviewed a lot of people in the last month, um, and the trailing spouse issue is a significant one, so I think there's, there's probably opportunities there to maybe take advantage of it. But I also just wanted to say, this is, thank you for your creativity and your energy. So it's nice to know that there are people really thinking hard about new ways to, to do this. So I'm leaving inspired, worried, but inspired. <laughs> so at this point, we'll open it up to the public for any public comments or questions of the panel. Yes, Dale. That's an excellent presentation. It's, it's worth going forward, but it's, it's a great plan. Um, how would I explain to somebody the cost of living situation? Like you mentioned, put in there how much you're going to make. But how do I take that further and explain to them that they can afford to live in Vermont on that salary wage for the next five years, as much as you can predict something like that? Um, the other one would be, I know this is an issue, is trying to explain schools to people. And that one you really do want to explain to them as in, you practically want to promise them, as long as your children are in school, you're going to have good schools because, hey, if you're a parent, that really matters. Um, let's see. Oh. This is my daughter's, not mine. She asked me this, I bet, 13 years ago. And we've been going back and forth on this one ever since. I'm thinking of this one as well because I saw with uh, 60 Below that Minnesota's going to have, they showed the indoor climate controlled living. And I thought for sure I'd get a phone call from her if she saw that. I did get a text message because that's the kind of thing that she has brought up in our just back and forth discussions is why Vermont doesn't have initiatives to develop those communities. Montreal has them, I know. I mean, that's one of the things I loved about them in the 70s when I went up there even. Um, Minnesota, as you can see, has them. Um, do you think there's anything there? I mean, I'm beginning to wonder myself, is there something to that for, you know, would that bring in another 2,000 people for a workforce? Um, climate controlled. There are places in the north that do that. Did you clarify like, climate controlled what? To what it is? I, I, I'm missing the last point about the, the climate control. Oh, Help okay. me understand what you're referring to. It's a climate controlled environment where you have housing and you have walkways. They can be above ground or they can be underground. And you're connecting the buildings. So like when I'm in Montreal, if they get three feet of snow and it was zero degrees out, it's my option if I wanna go outside and walk two blocks in that three feet of snow. And then I can go right back inside and walk 10 blocks the other way to go to work and I don't have to go back outside again. Oh, thank um, you for clarifying that or coffee or a restaurant, you, you always have a choice. You can live outdoors or you can live gouged mercilessly so that higher up people can make tons of money, can make these huge two and a half million dollar salaries. That was not touched on here, although salary requirements or incentives were, but this is a huge problem. 
and I hope we look at this. Another idea is education, and that's a great thing, but you can't access education unless you have $100,000 that you can part with. Um, the new inspection laws, for instance, for vehicle laws, hit poor people the hardest, where you have to buy another car every year to pass inspections. So I think you've got to start thinking of systematic. Um, wages don't pay enough to live. <coughs> You know, there are other countries where minimum wages are much higher. College education is more, is free. At the point of delivery, you pay for it out of your taxes early. All of that. How is it that they can do it and we can't? And I think the problem is, is that we still think of the buy low, sell high model of capitalism and that labor is something you buy low so you sell your product higher. And most wage earners in Vermont are not thought of as people who are assets to an organization. They're expendable. And I've been a personal victim of this. You get benefits at a company and the first thing they want to do is fire you because you're being paid too much. That's the reality of what most Vermont wage earners make and face every bloody day. So Excellent comments, Walter. I didn't see a question in there. so. Um, Jill, I saw your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I, I just had a couple of comments I wanted to make. First, I really wanted to thank the board for its attention to this issue. I, I think that it's actually deeply tied to health care reform. As I talk to my members about <coughs> our role in health care reform and how we might migrate some of our care away from our more expensive settings and into the home, which is really a great idea and a great solution, what, the first thing they always say to me is, where are we going to find the staff to do that work? So it's really, I think, we're gonna bump up against that as we try to make those migrations because um, we're experiencing that nursing shortage just like everyone else. Um, I really also wanted to um, really thank your panel. Um, the um, Laura's Association has really taken an incredible lead role in articulating this problem, and I think that it's, um, everything that she said really, I think, would resonate with my members too. Um, we're really struggling uh, in all of the same ways and when you get to that PCA workforce in particular a whole other set of challenges and it's not a primary primarily education solution because it's not actually about that it's not a, a workforce that requires higher education it's really a much more complex uh, set of circumstances um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is I really want to support the idea of bringing the healthcare workforce group into the which has been floating into the, the broader um, uh, workforce uh, board. I think that's the right direction. I do think that board will need some healthcare folks on it in order for the subcommittee to make any sense and link back. Did I say everybody, the right people nodding, yes. Um, but, uh, and I can tell you that I have members who would be glad to serve if you were uh, looking for people. So um, I, I think that's a great idea and, and definitely the right direction. And the last thing I just want to say is, Sarah, I love the pick a path. Like, we're just going to pick a path and go, because I do feel like on this issue in particular, we have done a lot of studying, thinking, talking, reporting, and not, as, not enough doing, at least in the time that I've been uh, looking at this issue. So I, I really appreciate that sentiment, and I think that's, that's absolutely right on. Thank you, Jill. Ken? Thank you, uh, and thank you for the conversation. I think it's uh, very important subject. It's been one that's been discussed for many, many years and um, obviously needs to be discussed more because the solutions aren't totally apparent. I, I had a couple of thoughts and ideas that I, I'd just like to ask the panel particularly uh, to respond. I think there's going to be two ideas and I'm not sure which one will be most unpopular. Um, so let me just lay out uh, the idea, and, and it really stems from an uh, incident I had about four years ago, four and a half years ago, I was at some kind of social gathering party, and I met uh, the person sitting next to me, and we got talking, and I asked her what she did, and she said she was a visiting nurse. So, you know, always wanting to learn more, I, after talking to her for about 15 minutes, I kind of came to the conclusion of, if one, that this is a very highly competent nurse, and two, that she was being extremely well paid as a traveling nurse. 
And so, and, and, oh, and the other part was she was working at the new psychiatric hospital in Berlin. So I did ask her, um, you know, what would it take for her to not be a traveling nurse, but to work here? And she kind of laughed because she, she had looked around and she said, you know, the salaries are really not very attractive. Um, and that's just a global statement. Whether it's accurate, I don't know. But she would know more than I certainly would know. Um, so part of, part of my question really relates to the question of um, would an increase in salary, we're particularly talking about nurses a lot in the presentation, so I was just looking at that. Um, you know, and to some degree, many of the settings that we're talking about could redistribute some of their funds to elevate uh, the salary of nurses and other areas. Um, so one idea I had, which uh, will be very unpopular in some quarters, would be to tie the percentage increase for nurses to the same percentage that administrators get at Vermont hospitals, which I think has been about 5 to 10 percent over the last three years. And I think that kind of increase would have a startling impact on the recruitment of nurses over a few year period. So that's the first question. The other is, has any thought been given to what I would call sort of change through radical disruption? And um, I'm particularly talking about the issue of visiting nurses. I was in some ways astounded at the amount of money Vermont spending in healthcare on, on visiting nurses. I don't know what the figure is, but it's- If you use traveling nurses, it would be better. Because whenever you say visiting nurses, we think of our own. My head, yeah. Traveling. Yeah. Traveling nurses. Giving children also. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> traveling nurses, excuse me. So suppose someone or the group here recommends that Vermont in the next two years mandate a reduction in this type of nursing procurement by 50 percent. And my argument is it would take that kind of radical action to perhaps uh, encourage and incentivize the governor, the legislature, the Green Mountain Care Board to really take major tangible steps in this area. Because in the absence of doing that, it just seems like the system sort of drifts around. So those are the two ideas. Uh, both of them are, are suspect, but wanted to get a reaction. I'm, I'm, happy. Want to jump on those? I'm happy to take that one first. Uh, with regard to your second um, suggestion of um, the you know, mandating a reduction in the use of traveling nurses, that'd be great if we actually had nurses that we could backfill the work that those traveling nurses are doing. I mean, the reason we're hiring traveling nurses is because we don't have an adequate number of nurses in Vermont to provide the services we need them to provide. So, you know, I would really worry about the, um, the consequences of doing something like that. Um, we don't have bodies, and, and that's the problem. We've got to attract, we've got to attract nurses to the state. With respect to uh, increasing the salaries, um, you know, and correlate that increase with increases in administrative positions. What I would say to that is, you know, I don't care if you're a nursing home, a hospital, you know, a VNA, uh, you know, Bay Auto Home Health. You're benchmarking your salaries so that you are, you know, as competitive as you can be. And depending on where you're recruiting from, that's either a more local benchmarking, a regional benchmarking, a national benchmarking. So, you know, I, I'm not sure that that necessarily. Um, gets us anywhere because we are providing what we need to provide to be able to be competitive. The bottom line is we need nurses, we need primary care physicians, we need, we need bodies in Vermont. So I, I, I definitely appreciate um, the creativity in your suggestions, but um, that's at least my initial reaction. I don't know if anybody has a different... Is there other public comment or questions? Yes. Meredith. Yes. Um, Ideally, you want to be able to grow your own nurses, but part of the problem is that interchange between the, the education and the, the RNs graduating. So you have nurse faculty that are hired at less, that we're talking at state colleges, at less than the median for the nurse salaries. You have recruiters at the, you know, that are trying to get nurse faculty, um, trying to recruit 
from hospitals, those nurse practitioners that are, that are earning $100,000 per your <coughs> statistics. So you're asking them to take a 30, sometimes a $60,000 paycheck to go into education, which is problematic. You also have on the other end, the students that are having huge tuition problems dropping out. I, I was an educator 15 years in yeah, nursing. And you know, you're seeing your students that are dropping out because they can't afford the tuition. And you know, thank God for the higher education funding that's coming in so we don't have to raise the tuition more for these students. So I love the idea Laura had about recruiting like veterans and you know the, the nursing that are in those kind of states. I have concerns about the compact that have been raised about the disciplinary not being at the local level. So that's, that's the big concern there. So um, I, I wanna make sure that if we are joining a compact, then we are having it, not losing our disciplinary um, capability at the board of nursing level. Um, but we can, there are a lot of incentives that, that people want to become nurses, but what happens often when they become nurses and they want to go in there and nurture is the staffing is inadequate, they're burning out. I've heard stories of, I mean, I've heard horrific stories from, from nursing students and people that are working LPN going into RN programs of their, their staffing issues and trying to, to medicate too many patients um, worrying about their license and that being part of why they're going out of nursing. Even sometimes, you know, nurses that have been at uh, like UPN Medical Center going into, like the, the, I went in my online class right now that talked about going into juvenile corrections because it was a much better environment for her. And that's not to mention that nurses are attacked more than the police officers and correctional guards. So um, thank you for what you're trying to do. Great comments, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for having us. Yeah. So with that under old business, we had promised at the last meeting to talk about the um, uh, moratorium on CONs for um, home health. And I know that we're being pressed out of the room, but we're gonna try to do it quickly. So Jill, do you wanna address anything before we have a conversation? Um, I guess I could just say a couple of things that's, that's helpful. One, um, the, it is going to the Senate floor tomorrow, so um, if you want to weigh in, it will be, I think, in the House, because the Senate is <laughs> zipped right along. Um, but really, I think what you'll hear on the Senate floor when the bill is um, discussed is that the reason that there's a suspension of, C of home health CONs currently in place were really for three, it was for three reasons. To let healthcare reform have a chance to uh, grow, to um, see what impact we have actually had from the <laughs> wide CON for Biota um, in Vermont. And oh, and the third one is just escaping me. Uh, oh, to allow time to actually go back and look at the CON statutes and the HRAP. So last year we did take a look at the HRAP, um, and I know that you, you guys worked on a bill with the legislature, and now you're hard at work on the HRAP, but that really won't be finished until our. Um, our moratorium is up, and then you won't yet have home health guidelines. So we really want to make sure that we've got guide, good, solid guidelines in place before we start having home health CONs. And then the other piece that we're concerned about is that um, healthcare reform has really not fully come to the home and community-based services yet. The plan for that isn't even due until next year, and then it's not supposed to be implemented until the, the next uh, cycle of the all-payer model. So we really want to make sure that we have a certain amount of stability in our very uh, planned system before we start having um, any significant changes. So I think that's what you're going to hear on the Senate floor uh, tomorrow. And um, really, we're hoping um, if the board is neutral on the bill, I think that that will be that would be actually enough for the for the um, for the House. What we really are are interested in is that you are not opposing it because I think that will make things a lot more confusing. So, so I, I <laughs> that's our concern. As one board member, that I personally support the moratorium. I think that it makes sense, and I don't think that uh, we are a state with a significant, uh, significantly large population that allows for, um, in some cases, cherry picking. So um, that's my own personal stance. But other board members can 
I agree. I, I'm with you, Kevin. I'm, I'm supportive of the moratorium. I think, especially given um, some of the, this is timely to talk about in the context of workforce and all the workforce challenges as well. I, I don't see new entrances helping with the situation. Any board feedback? I'm board. certainly not opposed to it. The board so. doesn't have to take a position on it either. We we did um, we did before watch this get extended once and um, did not take a position, and that was fine. Yep. So I think what's pretty clear, at least so far, I haven't heard anybody say they're opposed. I hope they would take this opportunity to um, step up and speak if they are. But at this point, I believe that um, no one on the board is opposed. Very very yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Very helpful. You're welcome. Okay, is there any other old business to come before the board? If not, is there any new business to come before the board? I just had a very quick piece of new business which relates to uh, the legislate. There, there's been, a, as people know, a contingency planning group around the cost sharing reduction issues that, that the federal government has raised. Last year, we, there was legislation passed allowing the board to silver load um, premiums to offset the, the funding that wasn't coming through for the cost sharing reduction program. Um, that, that contingency plan group has, is, has some recommendations to broaden um, and make the board's authority more flexible so that we, we aren't required um, in to necessarily always do a silver load. It, for example, right now, there was some concern that the federal government might, might disallow silver loading, and then our legislation would put us in kind of a bind because uh, it doesn't really allow us enough flexibility to do other things. So the new, new language would simply provide us more flexibility should that even come into a eventuality at some point um, to address it, essentially. So I wanted to let folks know that that recommendation is coming out of that work group. Um, and similarly, I would assume that we would not be opposed to ensuring that we get the flexibility to, to do what we need to do if there's an unexpected federal change. And I should say it's clear now, based on some federal guidance that was issued, that silver loading is still allowed for 2020. So this is not an immediate issue, uh, but would address potential issues that would come up in a couple of years. So again, I, I don't think there's any opposition, but this is the opportunity for any board member to say if they're opposed to that, but I think that uh, you know, it's the, the right thing, so. I just have a question. Sure. Uh, so I'm looking at the language um, in uh, paragraph three here, where it says the Green Mountain Care Board shall ensure the funding to offset the loss of federal cost sharing reduction payments is included exclusively. Um, um, I'm just, you know, if, I don't know how we um, ensure funding other than to make insurance companies pay for it somehow or something. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, so maybe, this, maybe this, not. Right, this paragraph basically expresses a legislative preference for silver loading um, uh, if there is not federal funding for cost sharing reductions which is what we did last year in our premium rate setting process. So this would be something that we would consider as part of the premium rate setting, rate review process. And Tom, that would be to maximize those um, subsidies. The silver loading does that, so that's the preferable route that the group has discussed, and that's all that really does is to say, we're, if we can maximize the federal subsidies, we'll do so. If we are not able to do so under the federal, whatever federal change comes on down the pike, um, we'll do something else, we have flexibility, but this just says as long as we can maximize those under this plan as it be. So, so my, the way I take that is that, you know, silver loading has allowed us to access the, um, the advanced premium tax credit, and it was kind of a zero sum game. And so right. if, if the federal government takes away that opportunity, this would mandate us to find